Hi, I'm Dr. Brett Carroll. I'm the medical director of the Aortic Center at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Today, we're going to be talking about the management of aortic aneurysms. I have no disclosures. A brief outline of what we'll be discussing. First, the medical management and counseling of patients with aortic aneurysms. Appropriate interval surveillance imaging, indications for repair, and those repair options. So first, I think it's important to note that these patients are likely best cared in a multidisciplinary fashion, which involves cardiovascular medicine for a full assessment of the etiology and family appropriate screening, vascular surgery, cardiac surgery, and cardiovascular imaging. It's in this setting where patients get a comprehensive approach to their care. In terms of the medical management, for the treatment of aortic aneurysm, it's really a focus on blood pressure control. That includes a blood pressure goal less than 120. Some will advocate for reducing that blood pressure even further if tolerated by the patient, but generally a goal in the one teens is appropriate. In terms of agent, the initial agent of choice is a beta blocker. Traditional studies have demonstrated propanolol to reduce the rate of aortic dilation, though frequently now we're using metoprolol succinate given ease of once daily dosing. The goal of a beta blockers to reduce the myocardial contractility and pulse pressure. The way I describe it to patients is that you can imagine your aorta is a balloon, and the larger a balloon gets, the easier it is to expand. That's just physics. And our goal is to decrease that pressure as much as possible, and a beta blocker helps us achieve that. Additionally, to lower the blood pressure if agents are needed beyond beta blocker alone is the use of uh, ARBs. Uh, ARBs uh, have been shown to decrease the rate of aortic dilation and it's thought due to the target and blockade of the TJF beta pathway. This has been shown in mice models and in patients with Marfan syndrome. We extrapolate that data uh, for patients with other aneurysms, although it's not as clearly associated with benefit in patients outside of Marfan syndrome. There's even mixed data within the Marfan patient cohort. That said, it tends to be the second agent of choice after a beta blocker. There is some early data demonstrating that calcium channel blockers may increase the rate of dilation uh, this is still relatively limited data, but I tend to avoid these unless really needed uh, after multiple trials with other antihypertensive agents. And then a statin. Statins have not been clearly demonstrated to decrease the rate of aortic dilation. However, a lot of these patients have concomitant atherosclerotic risk factors, or in patients that have a AAA, an abdominal aortic aneurysm, that's associated with high cardiovascular mortality, and that's the reason to initiate a statin, to decrease their overall cardiovascular risk rather than uh, risk of the aortic aneurysm itself. So in terms of activity restrictions, a lot of these patients describe having a time bomb in their chest. Along with reassurance, uh, it's important to advocate for them to stay active, though to avoid certain activities. Again, these patients are very worried about doing any activity, with, along with reassurance that if their risk was so high that they would have an event that we would repair them at this point, they can go about their normal activity, certainly, but I want to avoid heavy lifting. I don't put a strict weight criteria, a little old lady is going to have difficulty lifting 20 pounds, where a more robust younger male may have uh, no problem with 20 pounds. I generally advocate for avoiding heavy lifting where there's difficulty breathing through or lifting to failure. So in those that like to exercise in the gym, I ask them to avoid that last rep where they really have to bear down when the blood pressure will go through the roof. Avoidance of straining, whether with lifting or constipation, is also important. Repetitive straining and valsalva with constipation can drive up the blood pressure as well and put increased shear stress on the aorta. So management of constipation, if that happens to be a problem for the patient, is important. I do ask the patient to avoid high-intensity aerobic activity, things like interval training, where they're putting a lot of stress uh, on their aorta. Uh, moderate intensity aerobic activity is healthy. And again, overall, we have to balance what is the benefit of these activities versus the risk to the aorta. And overall, the benefit is there for cardio moderate cardiovascular activity. There's a nice handout by the AHA by Chada et al. in 2014 evaluating patients specifically post-aortic dissection, so a little bit of a higher risk cohort than maybe a more moderate aneurysm, but it helps to give in more detail some guidance for patients. So it's important to keep a close eye on these patients with surveillance imaging. The frequency and modality is really tailored for the location of the aneurysm, the age of the patient, the growth rate of that aneurysm, and a particular risk of that patient. There are various modalities that we can choose from, including MRA, 
So this is a benefit, particularly for younger patients, as it doesn't expose them to uh, high doses of radiation over time, uh, as they will be getting frequent scans, so an MRA may be a nice option for those patients. Uh, CTA offers great definition of the aortic border, uh, especially when done with ECG gating. And then an echocardiogram. An echo is great uh, as it allows, again, no radiation exposure. You can evaluate for any concomitant valvular disease, including a bicuspid aortic valve or mitral valve prolapse. And in patients that have primarily in involvement of their aortic root or the proximal portion of the ascending aorta, that can sometimes be visualized well. This is a nice option, particularly for patients if you have uh, serial imaging, both by cross-sectional imaging, either MR or CT, and an echo, and you find that there's good correlation, thereafter uh, an echocardiogram should be relatively accurate. Again, a baseline echo for anyone with an aneurysm to evaluate for valvular disease. And you can consider non-aortic arterial imaging for particularly high-risk patients. That would include maybe evaluation for intracranial aneurysm, popliteal, or iliac artery aneurysm. In terms of the frequency of surveillance imaging, in whatever modality you may choose, those that have a degenerative or sporadic ascending aneurysm, it's recommended annual screening, 3.5 to 4.4. And then as you get closer to the, the threshold of surgery, which we'll discuss momentarily, biannual or every six month imaging. Now you have to tailor this again to a patient's risk. Have they been stable for years? And they probably don't need annual imaging. Has it been growing relatively rapidly? Then maybe you need to increase the frequency at which you image. And as they get closer to the threshold of surgery for the individual, again, you may increase that that imaging frequency. If they have a genetically mediated aneurysm, uh, ascending aneurysm specifically, including Marfan syndrome, Lois Dietz, Ehlers-Danlos, or someone with a strong family history, whether a, a known genetic defect or just a strong family history of dissection or aneurysm, you reduce uh, your threshold at which you surveil uh, on uh, increasing frequency to 3.5 to 3.9 for annual screening, and then 4.0 to 5.0 centimeters, you do biannual screening. Again, you would tailor it to the patient's individual uh, growth rate and risk. For descending aneurysms, slightly higher threshold in terms of the size and the rate at which you would screen. And then for a AAA, if it's three to 3.9 centimeters, it's every three years, four to 4.9 annual screening, 5.0 to 5.4 centimeters would be biannual or every six month uh, imaging. And again, these are basic guidelines. There are various uh, organizations that have uh, tailored these numbers. Uh, and again, you want to be uh, as specific to the patient as possible to not increase the risk of exposure to dye and radiation, but also make sure you're keeping a close eye on their aneurysm. In terms of indication for repair, similar to how we think of surveillance imaging, we want to tailor this to the patient, including what is the etiology of their aneurysm, where is the location, how old is the patient, and what is their risk of having an aortic catastrophe in the near future. Some will incorporate height or body surface area. So if a patient is at one extreme or the other, either a very small statured uh, patient or a larger patient, or if they're female versus male, you'd want to put that into consideration by indexing the aortic uh, size uh, to that patient, where a small patient may have a slightly lower threshold to intervene than a larger patient. Do they have a strong family history? You don't want to wait till 5.0 centimeters if a pa patient has a known family history of a dissection at 4.7 centimeters. You would lower your threshold in such a patient. Obviously, if a patient has concerning symptoms or a rapidly expanding aneurysm, so symptoms would include certainly chest pain or back pain in someone with a thoracic aortic aneurysm, though that's rare without a dissection. More so for a AAA, do they have back discomfort uh, or abdominal discomfort that you're worried for a uh, more increased inflammatory component to their aneurysm? Certainly, if they have a concomitant dissection, these thresholds may change, and that's outside the scope of the talk today. In terms of various thresholds, they have a degenerative or sporadic ascending aneurysm. Your threshold will be 5.5 centimeters for repair. If a patient has a connective tissue disorder like Marfan's, Ehlers-Danlos, or a strong familial component to their aneurysm, then it'll be 5.0 centimeters. Lois Dietz is a little bit lower, as are some of the higher risk uh, genetic abnormalities like a SMAT3 mutation, that'd be closer to 4 or 4.5 centimeters. In a patient that has a bicuspid aortic valve, the original guidelines back in 2010 recommended a threshold of 5.0. They have since been revised, and it's now recommended a 5.5 centimeter threshold. There is some wiggle room if a patient has high-risk features, including rapid growth greater than 0.5 to 1 centimeter in a year, or if a patient has a family history of a rupture or dissection at a relatively uh, small aneurysm size, then you would consider a lower threshold. If a patient is undergoing 
surgery for the aortic valve, aortic regurgitation or aortic stenosis, the threshold is lower. Obviously, if they're going to be in there with an open chest, you want to fix it with a lower threshold of 4.5. Descending aneurysms tend to be 5.5 to 6. Based on the European guidelines, 5.5 is recommended if it's uh, can be repaired, which we'll discuss in a moment with an endovascular approach. If it needs to be an open repair, then it'd be closer to 6.0. And then finally, a AAA tends to be 5.5 centimeters, but again, there's wiggle room based on the patient's uh, size, sex, or uh, if it's growing relatively rapidly. In terms of the modality uh, of repair, we want to tailor this as well to the etiology, location, age, and risk. So if it's an ascending aneurysm, there are some valve sparing procedures that are an option. So if the involved portion of the aneurysm is really the mid ascending aorta, then that can be done with just a graft and the valve can be left in place. There are other procedures where they remodel the aortic root or they can re-implant the patient's native aortic valve if it's functioning appropriately within the graft. Uh, and that allows a patient to avoid a prosthetic aortic valve, but still have uh, the benefit of an aortic repair. Dental procedure is the most commonly done when there is involvement of the aortic root. This is replacement with a prosthetic aortic valve and uh, the portion of the diseased aorta. In terms of a, the descending aneurysm, there's a few more options. Open repair has been the traditional option and is still recommended for patients with a connective tissue disease, but there's growing availability and utilization of TVAR, or thoracic endovascular aortic repair. And in specialized centers, you can have physician-modified endografts or fenestrated grafts. You can imagine when you're putting this graft within the disease portion of the aorta, if there happens to be an important branch vessel, whether renal down in the abdominal aortic aneurysm region or uh, a celiac or mesenteric artery involved, these physician-modified endografts or fenestrated grafts offer some greater opportunities to allow perfusion to those vital organs, but also protection uh, against aneurysm uh, degeneration, uh, but also to avoid an open repair. And again, you have to put the particular patient uh, in mind, is the patient high risk for an open surgery, then maybe you would have a lower threshold uh, to place an endograft. Or if the patient is young and otherwise healthy, maybe given the longevity of an open repair, you would favor that. Uh, the same is true for AAA. Open repair has uh, been available for decades and there's been increasing utilization of EVAR and physician-modified endografts over the last decades. Finally, to conclude, I think it's very important to incorporate various disciplines within um, your care team for aortic disease, including a non-invasive approach with close surveillance imaging, optimal medical management, discussion regarding family screening, and any genetic testing that may be appropriate, along with excellent surgeons where you can coordinate the care. What is the appropriate threshold for a particular patient? What is their risk for undergoing surgery? You want to really individualize that approach to repair. It's certainly not a one-size-fits-all for these patients, and there's an incorporation of a lot of factors when deciding when they should go to surgery and what is the appropriate surgery. And discussing with your surgeons in a multidisciplinary fashion can often be helpful and obviously incorporating the patient's goals uh, and ideals in that discussion.